nice one. Please be seated. It is a great joy for me and also a distinct honor today to formally open the second semester, the summer semester of the 2019-2020 academic year. Why is today a more special opening of the academic year than it usually, oh, sorry, of the academic semester than it usually is? That is because today, rests upon the Grand Chancellor, who will be arriving a little bit later at 11.15, and myself, the great privilege and honor on behalf of the Holy See to hand out eight formal professorial appointments uh, in the faculty. Now, you might wonder, aren't our professors already professors? Yes, they are. <laughs> Don't worry. You were not being taught by uh, primary school teachers. You are being taught by academics, professors with impressive academic records. However, since we are a uh, faculty according to canon law, there is a formal procedure that requires that each person teaching here in a permanent or fixed position has to go through a so-called nihil obstat procedure. It's a sort of a vetting process where uh, the candidates are vetted by the Holy See through the Congregation for Catholic Education and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith that involves a lot of documentation in which it is ascertained by the Holy See that everybody who teaches at a canonically erected faculty or university not only has the proper academic credentials to do so, but also has the proper, if I may say so, Catholic credentials to do so. Uh, so various things are checked. And due to a series of circumstances, this procedure has taken very long. This has nothing to do with our faculty. Um, rest assured, we have no heretics amongst our faculty. Um, this has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that um, our Holy Mother Church lives by the concept of eternity. And uh, especially in Rome, eternity is strongly present in the workings of the various congregations. Uh, so let me just put it at that. Um, this all being uh, for your explanation uh, to put some peace to you, the students, because some of you might have really been wondering why are we having this now and uh, why only now and not earlier? Uh, why not, let's say, 10 years ago or why not 15 years ago? Um, now you know a little bit uh, and maybe um, um, Dr. Meyerhofer can say 
uh, in his classes in church history a little bit uh, about this, how things, uh, how things uh, in the church run, that they are sometimes at a different pace uh, than our fast-paced world. But all the more we are grateful today that uh, the congregation, after doing its homework and doing its investigation and its research, has uh, given us the distinct honor uh, in a first go, because obviously there are more professors on our faculty than the eight that will receive their formal professorial appointments today, and the others are in the process, but it's my distinct honor and joy today uh, that we will be conferring uh, those associate professorships and extraordinary professorships and full professorships upon eight of my colleagues today. And um, it was only yesterday that I received a, uh, a um, message from our Grand Chancellor, Cardinal Schoenborn, that he was going to attend this ceremony today. And of course, as our Grand Chancellor, that is a great honor that he is once again um, making time in his uh, calendar and it's especially, uh, especially a privilege for us because, as some of you know, not only did our Grand Chancellor have a um, massive operation during the summer, uh, he landed again in hospital in November with an acute uh, lung embolia. Um, and <coughs> he has been recovering ever since. And uh, it is really quite... Uh, quite a privilege that despite that he insisted that he wanted to be amongst us today. So he will arrive at 11.15 during the musical intermezzo so that, as the Cardinal wrote me, he would really like to personally confer, confer uh, the appointment decrees upon the eight professors. Now, for you to understand the procedure a little bit and um, that you know what will be happening, there are two decrees that each of the uh, newly appointed professors will be receiving. One is the official decree from the Holy See, uh, the so-called Nihil Obstat decree, which says that the Holy See sees no reasons why not uh, to have those professors teach here. It's a beautiful document with the seal uh, of the Holy See. And the second um, decree that they will receive is a decree from the Grand Chancellor in which their, professional, their professorial appointment is signed by him. Those eight professors will also uh, once again say the oath of fidelity, which is required of every person teaching at a canonically erected faculty. As you remember, we as a whole faculty always say the oath of fidelity at the beginning of the academic year, but the eight uh, professors who will re be receiving their formal appointments will say the oath of fidelity again today. And then those professors that have been appointed as a full professor, namely as the holder of a chair, or have been appointed as an extraordinary professor, an extraordinary professor is basically um, a full professor without yet uh, holding the chair, but for the rest having uh, fulfilled all the qualifications for that, the four professors who are receiving either a full professorship or an extraordinary professorship will be receiving a academic Barrett from me. I thought I'd just explain uh, these details of the ceremony to you. So I now pass to the Dean, whom I would like to ask to please introduce our academic speaker for today. It has already become a kind of tradition to have a short academic lecture at the beginning of the semester. And I'm pleased to ask Professor Spindelberg today to give his lecture to us. I think he will introduce by himself about what he's teaching because I have a, a sheet of paper on my table, but not here. So, <laughs> therefore, Therefore, I ask him to stand up and to, to introduce himself, please.
dear rector, dear dean, dear professors and students, dear guests and friends of the ITI. The academic lecture has the title Challenges in Postmodern Bioethics for Christian Faith and Morality. I will try to address some problems and give answers in the perspective of Christian faith and morality. At the beginning, we look at the present situation in church and society and in bioethics in general. Secondly, I will analyze the connection of ecological awareness and sexual identity. In the third part, I try to give a moral assessment of special questions in sexual identity. And in the fourth part, in the way of a conclusion and encouragement, we might ask for perspectives of renewal regarding human dignity in its divine origin and relation. First, the present situation in church, society and bioethics in general. Today's world is characterized by a pluralism of attitudes regarding faith and morality. And even within the Christian community, and in some way also within the Catholic Church, there is much of diversity and even confusion regarding not only some singular problems and challenges, but even the fundaments. As Holy Pope John Paul II, whose 100th birthday we celebrate this year, has formulated it in his encyclical Veritatis Splendor of August uh, 8, 1993. He wrote, it is no longer a matter of limited and occasional dissent, but of an overall and systematic calling into question of traditional moral doctrine on the basis of certain anthropological and ethical presuppositions. At the root of these presuppositions is the more or less obvious influence of currents of thought which end by detaching human freedom from its essential and constitutive relationship to truth. Thus, the traditional doctrine regarding the natural law and the universality and the permanent validity of its precepts is rejected. Certain of the church's moral teachings are found simply unacceptable and the magisterium itself is considered capable of intervening in matters of morality only in order to exhort consciences and to propose values, in the light of which each individual will independently make his or her decisions and life choices. So far, John Paul II, in his analysis at the beginning of Veritatis Splendor. In the field of biology and ecology, there are special challenges in the present time. Man has become enormous powerful in the way that he can apply empirical knowledge which affects the very roots of life, including plants, animals and human beings. There are possibilities of genetic analysis and reconstruction which seem to equip the genetic engineers, as we might call them, with all the elements needed for a new form of creating not only things, but living beings, including man himself, if possible. Man seems to become his own creator. A new technology called CRISPR gene editing allows at the present stage of development even substantial modifications and manipulations in the genetic structure of living beings. Of course, there are both hopes and fears which are related to this method. And as an example of a very affirmative attitude towards these new inventions and biotechnologies, a famous female scientist of Austro-Brazilian origin named René Schröder has published a book titled The Fabrication of Man, How We Might Outwit Evolution. In German, die Erfindung des Menschen, wie wir die Evolution überlisten. Her main statements in this context are as following. I sum them up now. She says, human beings are the product of evolution based on chance, which has no place for God and any form of teleology. 
Now man has come to a point in history on which he himself has to organize his own evolution and that of other living beings. In this way, man could possibly improve the quality and form of his existence, not only in external affairs, but including the genetic structure and disposition. This female scientist denies any authentic and original freedom and responsibility of man. Moral norms are only a sociological reality and are relative. And moral normativity is subject to changes in time and history, according to the circumstances. New forms of sexual identity should be developed, she says. And in the future, there might be a stage of human self-evolution in which man could organize his consciousness in a new way, independently from organic functions and from his body, which is seen merely instrumental and accidental. All this points to theories of so-called transhumanism, in which the goodness of being human in the unity of body and soul is fundamentally denied. A new form of life is desired which is free from any bonds, and we might add that here the concept of creation is shattered in its very fundaments. There is no longer a place for an inalienable human dignity and for human rights and duties which are inscribed into the, into the nature of man. Could we truly desire such a brave new world? That's the question. Second, the connection of ecological awareness and sexual identity. In the last years up to the present time, public awareness and political programs and discussions have been focused to the ecological crisis. What are the roots of such actions of dominion and destruction which have led to this crisis instead of responsible forms of stewardship over God's good creation? As an effect, not of genuine and authentic Christian culture, but of atheistic rationalism, man has made use of scientific knowledge in a manipulative and even disastrous way. Man thinks that everything is subject to his power. He no longer accepts innate laws of nature. The bond between freedom and truth has been declared obsolete. The consequences of this technocratic mentality are that man must fear to destroy even the basis of natural life, including plants, animals and human beings. Who can protect nature from this disastrous influence of man? Who can protect man himself from destruction and annihilation by himself? The Catholic Church has taken part in the fears and hopes of man in the last decades, and she does so at present time. And the popes of these decades have repeatedly expressed the view of the Church regarding the divine origin of creation as a whole and of man's special responsibility to be a protector of this visible world and not her final destructor. Already, John Paul II and then Benedict XVI and, of course, also Francis spoke of the necessity of a human ecology. For we cannot effectively protect the nature around us if we do not respect human dignity and human rights. Here a quotation uh, from Caritas in Veritate by Pope Benedict XVI. He wrote, the book of nature is one and indivisible. It takes in not only the environment, but also life, sexuality, marriage, the family, social relations, in a word, in a word integral human development. Our duties towards the environment are linked to our duties towards the human person, considered in himself and in relation to others. There is a natural law which is inscribed into the heart of every human person. 
and man should not behave as if he were his own creator and the master of the universe independently from God. The consequences of such a view might be disastrous. There's a famous scriptural passage uh, speaking of this, nat this natural law of man in the letter to the Romans by St. Paul. He writes, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature observe the prescriptions of the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the demands of the law are written in their hearts, while the, their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even defend them on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge people's hidden works through Christ Jesus. Here the apostle first speaks of Jewish law of the Torah and then he uh, asks about the Gentiles, about the non-Jews, uh, what uh, is there a law uh, which is accessible to them? Can they know a law independently from divine revelation? And he affirms it and says, yes, the law is written into their hearts and they should follow this law which shows them the moral goodness of actions. So we affirm this moral law and today in postmodern uh, culture and mentality uh, in a special way the sexual identity of man is questioned by various forms of gender theory as also the former author René Schröder told us. In an extreme view, man himself wishes to determine sexual identity and the body is no more relevant. If the body does not correspond to one's own wishes, then it will be manipulated surgically or with hormonal treatments. The consequences of these views show their influence and relevance even in legislation and in public life. For example, the University of Vienna in December 2019 proposed new guidelines for a gender-sensitive language, including not only male and female persons, but also a so-called third option of gender identity. No longer persons should be addressed in official language and documents with Herr and Frau, and the gender sensitivity should be expressed with using little stars, avoiding typically male and female functions and formulations. The Austrian Constitutional Court in June 2018 has de had decided that in official personal registers there must be a third option besides male and female. I find here is much of ideology and little sensitivity for persons truly suffering from deficits in sexual identity. There are of course persons who are not clear about their sexual identity and who might express, express wishes for bodily transformation. Nevertheless, these persons are instrumentalized by such an ideology as described. Therefore, I now turn in part three to a moral assessment of special questions in sexual identity. From the view of Christian ethics and moral theology, I will try to answer the following question. What would be the right way in dealing with persons who suffer from problems in sexual identity? In this special form of transgender. One thing should be clear from the beginning. In the genetic code, there may be aberrations, but in most cases, the so-called genotype informs us with certainty and decides about the question to which sex a person belongs. Biologically, persons are either male or female according to the structure of the chromosomes. There is XX in female and XY in male human persons. And if in a rare and single case it seems difficult to decide, then this can justify neither the introduction of a third option for sexual identity in state registers, nor the total restructuring of language 
and arbitrary decisions to invent and define new forms of sexual identity. In concrete cases of problems in sexual identity, we have to distinguish the primary sexual determination, which has to do with the genetic disposition, that means with the genotype. We have to distinguish it from subsequent characteristics of sexual appearance, namely the so-called phenotype. If the phenomenal ca characteristics of sexual identity are not well developed, which might happen, then a confusion could take place. The parents of such a child, and even nurses and medical doctors, might think of a baby boy, he is a girl, and also the other way around. You may have heard of the life of the famous Austrian ski runner, Erika Schinecker. She, who is genetically a he, had famous results in skiing. But a series of personal experiences caused doubts in this alleged sportswoman. And a nearer investigation made it clear Erika was in truth Eric. She ended her career, and after surgical and medical treatment, it was clear for everybody this person had found his original and true sexual identity and could now live as a man. Since then, Eric has married and his wife bore him a daughter. Eric has never been in truth a woman, but he had wrongly been identified as a woman and this error was corrected later. So the phenotype showed some signs of femininity, but nevertheless, the genotype uh, was always male. From the moral point of view, it was therefore fully justified to apply medical help in treatment. All this was done with the informed consent of the patient. In this case, there was no manipulation, but a true therapeutic intervention. And the result was that Eric could find his true sexual identity and live according to it as a man. There's a famous film about this person about this man, Eric A. Ah, in brackets, the man der Weltmeisterin wurde. Another situation is given when a person decides to make an arbitrary change of sexual appearance by surgical and or hormonal, hormonal measures. The genetic identity cannot be changed and by such actions an objective contradiction is established between the genotype and the phenotype. A mere subjective feeling and consciousness of a person who thinks to live in the wrong sex or body cannot be sufficient for an objective justification of medical interventions which do not follow the truths of genetic constitution. If a person suffers from a disturbance uh, of sexual identity, this could be a chance for him or her in moral maturation by integrating and accepting their own body. From the moral point of view, we must state therapeutic measures are helpful and justified only if the patient agrees and if such, such interventions correspond to the biological truths of the person. These are normative considerations. Another question is if in a single case a person is so disoriented that he or she is not aware of the objective norms of morality and only follows his or her subjective feelings and judgment. How far is this person responsible for what she or he does? According to the traditional doctrine of the church, the case might be this, that this person acts in an objectively wrong way, but due to internal and external factors which diminish her awareness of the objective truth and her subjective freedom, the imputability of this act is reduced, which has consequences for the gravity of sin in the subjective sphere. Here we could quote the catechism of the Catholic Church uh, in number uh, one, 
1735, which reads, imputability and responsibility for an action can be diminished or even nullified by ignorance, inadvertence, duress, fear, habit, inordinate attachments and other psychological or social factors. Nevertheless, this does not change the objective order of morality and the moral norms described. It's only a question how, how, uh, uh, how far a person has become guilty or not. I now come to a final statement and will formulate some conclusions. Perspectives of renewal, human dignity in its divine origin. In this last reflection, let's go back to the very fundaments of human dignity and ask for perspectives of more renewal in our present time. There's a twofold way to strengthen the awareness of human dignity, by reason and by faith. The first way is accessible to all human persons who can make use of their reason, independently from their social and cultural background and of their religious attitude. Here we might speak of the insights into the natural law of man according to a rightly formed conscience. As Christians, we should form coalitions with men and women of goodwill. That's clear for the church. And therefore, uh, she has addressed various doc documents explicitly to all men and women of goodwill. In this sense, everybody is welcome who affirms the inalienable dignity of man and the basic rights and duties following from it, such as corporal integrity, right of life, freedom of conscience, and religion. Here we, do, here we could also uh, quote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from December 10th, 1948. Preamble, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And Article 1, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This must be understood in the context of natural moral law, not of arbitrary affirmations and decisions. This is one way, the first way, by reason there is some insight into the natural moral law. But our motives as Christians are even deeper. We do not only rely on rational insights, but on divine revelation. God himself tells us in Holy Scripture that man and woman are of equal dignity and that they have been created to the image of God. The basic vocation of man is a vocation of love which is realized in a fundamental way in marriage and family and in a complementary and excellent way in virginity or celibacy. John Paul II wrote in Familiaris Consortio, love is therefore the fundamental and innate vocation of every human being. The perfection achieved by the love of Christ is our common goal and this means holiness and is an expression of Christian dignity. Saint Leo the Great uh, delivered a famous uh, sermon in which he wrote, Christian, recognize your dignity, and now that you share in God's own nature, do not return to your former base condition by sinning. Remember who is your head and of whose body you are a member. Never forget that you have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the delight of the kingdom of God. The perspective of holiness is decisive for our Christian life. We have been sanctified in holy baptism and sanctifying grace should be the basis for the actualization of all other vocations. Holiness is our common vocation 
and only this is decisive. It is realized in different ways according to the talents and charisms the Lord gives to every one of us. Here, the ITI has a special task to introduce all members, students and faculty more deeply into this anthropolo anthropological and theological truths. They are not abstract, but form a part of our lives. By relating to the spiritual sources in philosophy and theology, we gain important insights, and our motivation is strengthened to promote human dignity in the perspective of divine love. We have a task to improve the world in which we live. And we can do it on different levels according to the state and vocation of each of us. There is no room for pessimism since God himself is with us and he calls us to be in union with him and to do the good with the help of his grace. In this way, let us begin a new semester here at the ITI. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Father Spindelböck for this uh, truly engaging introduction into a theme and a problem that we are faced with every day. And I sometimes really wonder if in the nice um, cocoon that the ITI can sometimes be, we are fully cognizant and fully realize of this uh, major ideological onslaught uh, that we are seeing happening around us in the world and that is also very strongly entering academic life. Um, I know, for example, of a, a student at the University of Vienna who had trouble graduating because he refused to introduce into his academic work uh, the what is called gender-neutral language and uh, simply referring to he and she is uh, very often no longer accepted. And this is John, just a tip of the iceberg, uh, newspeak as uh, George Orwell would have called it. So I hope that this, uh, this excellent uh, introduction to the topic by Father Spindelböck, for which I say a warm thank you, is also a wake-up call uh, or a reminder uh, for all of us uh, that this is one of the key issues of our times and that you, having the privilege to study here, um, are called to actually engage in that debate and to push back this ideological onslaught. So there's a duty for you here. There's an assignment for you here. So it's not for nothing that uh, we choose this topic. So I hope you will be able to reflect on it and bring it into your classes, into your discussions, and really ask yourself the question, what can I do about this? How can I contribute to a healthy understanding of um, humanity, of sexuality, in a world that is pretty confused about it and that is uh, being very destructive at it? So you have some homework to do here. We will now um, have a short musical intermezzo and it is really uh, always wonderful to see uh, the musical talent we have at the ITI. We've had over the years not only our beautiful choirs and thank you again Philip Colomb for uh, on this short notice at the beginning of the second semester um, getting the choir again together. It is uh, one of the first things guests at the ITI always notice and comment upon uh, how beautiful the music uh, at the ITI is, especially during the liturgy. So we're very grateful for all the talent that we have, but we don't only have talent of voices, we have also talent of instruments. 
And I'm uh, specifically proud that uh, one of my students, in fact, in the Studium Generale program, Cecilia, where are you, Cecilia? Um, will be playing some pieces of Bach. And she will be playing selections from the cello suites number one and two by Johann Sebastian Bach, um, Bachwerk Verzeichnis 1007 in C major, 1008 in D major. And uh, those of you who know a little bit about music know that the cello suites by Bach are not necessarily the easiest pieces to play. So uh, thank you, Cecilia, for being willing to share your talent with us.
Thank you very much, Cecilia. I was hoping that would be an encore, but we will have to keep that uh, for another time. You see, the, the risk of uh, this uh, talents being discovered is that you will then be asked again and again to come and play. So uh, I think, Cecilia, that will certainly be the case for you as well. Um, as we are now waiting for the Grand Chancellor to arrive, let me uh, briefly outline the procedure of how we now proceed with the conferral of the decrees. Um, once uh, His Eminence has arrived and has spoken a few words, I will then uh, appoint, uh, I will then invite the newly appointed professors to stand. Uh, they will then be presented and introduced by me, followed by the Grand Chancellor inviting each of the appointees to recite the Oath of Fidelity together. And our chaplain, Father Juraj Terek, will present the Gospel to each one of them to lay their hand on, and they will then together recite the Oath of Fidelity. Afterwards, I will then invite the appointed professors to proceed to the table and to uh, sit down in order that they may sign two documents. One document in which they sign is a document in which they acknowledge having received the decrees and the second document to sign is a German version of the Oath of Fidelity that has also to be signed for the records uh, of the um, Archbishop of Vienna. After that, uh, I would ask, uh, they will then be handed the individual decrees by the Grand Chancellor, after which the associate professors will take their seats and the uh, full and extraordinary professors will pass on to me and receive their academic barret. The timing has been perfect because I see at the back of the room his eminence has arrived. Welcome, your eminence. May I ask you to please stand. His Eminence just gave me a gift. Thomas More's prayer book. Thomas More, saint Thomas More is my favorite saint. So this is very beautiful, thank you. The original prayers, facsimile of it, even copies. Beautiful, thank you, that's a great joy. Uh, I'll be reading the rest of the ceremony. <laughs> Can somebody else take over the formalities? Um, no, uh, I'm just joking. Thank you, Your Eminence. What a great joy that uh, you have joined us. Uh, it was such a beautiful surprise to receive your message uh, this, uh, this weekend that you will be joining us. Uh, and um, as we always say, and as is a tradition, we say, welcome home, Your Eminence. Um, we are soon coming to the point that you will be hopefully uh, amongst the faculty uh, of the ITI. Uh, we are eagerly awaiting that moment that you will be teaching here. Um, do you think I will need a Nihilopstat from Rome for that? <laughs> yes, it took the, the last one took a couple of years. So it's, uh, we're, we're very grateful, Your Eminence, that you are here. And with His Eminence has arrived uh, the Auxiliary Bishop of Vienna by Bishop Franz Schall, Welcome, uh, Bishop Schall. You are also very well known in this house, so it's a specifically great honor uh, that uh, you, uh, as well as His Eminence Cardinal Schoenborn, have joined us today. Um, I would, without further ado, like to invite you, Your Eminence, to say a few words.
Dear President, uh, lieber Weihbischof Franz, uh, dear faculty, uh, staff and students and benefactors, um, I am very happy to uh, make my, nearly my first uh, outgoing uh, after my um, quite serious uh, health problems uh, since beginning of January. I had a lung uh, infarct which was brought me very close to the hopefully heaven, heaven, yeah. it, uh, at, at least hopefully uh, to purgatory. Um, uh, but uh, through the very active help of my collaborators, they forced me to go to hospital. If they didn't have forced me to go to hospital, I would have gone uh, on the other side of, uh, of uh, well, hopefully paradise. But uh, so I, I'm trying to recover. It takes time, uh, but I'm very happy that I can celebrate with you the Eucharist of the new term. Uh, it's really a deep desire to, to be together in celebrating the mystery of our faith, which is uh, the summit and the source of our Christian life. Um, so, um, normally I have three points when I address uh, when when I when I try to speak so uh, three little points uh, the first point is an immense gratitude um, when uh, Saint John Paul uh, asked the Austrian bishops in 94 to open an institute for marriage and family after the fall of the Iron Court, of the, after the collapse of the communist regimes. Uh, he thought that Austria has a mission to bridge East and West and to bring, uh, uh, to, to bring uh, together those who had been officially enemies for decades, uh, the Western and the Eastern Bloc. Uh, you are, most of you are all, all too young to remember this time. Um, so with God's help, we began in uh, 95, uh, 96, 95 uh, in, in Gaming, in the former Charterhouse, former Kartause, uh, with a little little plant, uh, the ITI, and um, these twenty-five years now, quarter of a century, have shown us in an incredible way, uh, especially for me who who am a successor of the apostles and therefore weak in faith because Jesus had to ad admonish the apostles at least before Pentecost yeah, uh, that their faith is so weak. Um, so what I have learned in these years is that the Lord is really provident. He takes care uh, in an again and again surprising, astonishing, overwhelming way, which does not mean that uh, he needs co-workers for his providence. Uh, and uh, many, many co-workers have helped that uh, ITI is uh, a living reality. But uh, co-workers with the providence this great experience is um, very encouraging in a time where everybody wants security. 
me too, yeah, security. But uh, trusting in providence is, uh, um, is a great experience. And till today, we are, the ITI is an, a work that is dependent on God's providence. We have no endowment funds like Harvard or Yale. We have only a great trust in the Lord's providence. And, of course, we are called to be co-workers. Uh, you are co-workers as students, as uh, with the, the zeal and the enthusiasm and uh, the application of your, uh, the, the energy of your studies. Uh, allow me to say that uh, a dear confrere of mine, famous professor for New Testament, part of Father Speak, said always that to be a good student and a good professor, you need a good brain, but also a good, how do you call that? How do you call it in English? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> the temptation, the temptation to escape from your desk, from your chair, uh, is so great. But what you do when you study is providence. Providence for the future. What you study, what you learn, is an investment in uh, the life of the church. And therefore, uh, you are all co-workers of God's providence, and mainly the professors, and I'm so glad that I'm able today to uh, hand over uh, a series of Nihil Obstat from Rome, and that's already my Second point, we are a pontifical institute founded by a saint uh, with his vision of the importance of marriage and family for the future of the world, the, the church. Um, so uh, we are a pontifical institute and I invite you to have a cordial trust in the Holy Father, whoever he may be. I have, uh, in my lifetime, Pope uh, Pius XII, Paul VI, John XXIII, Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, Benedict and Francis, that makes seven popes. Yeah. They were all very, very different. Can you imagine the contrast between Pius XII and John XXIII? Can you imagine a contrast between twen John XXIII and Paul VI? And then the three, uh, four other popes that followed. But it's always the pope. It's always Peter. Uh, I have been accused uh, in blogs. Uh, I hope you are not addicted to blogs. Uh, that's a new disease, blog addiction. Uh, and it's, it's a very very nasty addiction, as are all addictions are nasty. Uh, uh, I am accused in the blogs that I, I am an, an Wendehals. How do you say? Uh, what is an Wendehals? Yeah. Uh, you, you change your, your flag according to the mood. Yeah. Uh, hmm? Weather. 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 Exactly. I'm accused to, 
maybe that's true, but uh, I can sincerely tell you from the deepest of my heart, I was always loyal to the Holy Father because he is Peter. Whether he is John the Twenty Third, a round uh, uh, old Paisan, yeah, uh, or uh, Paul the Sixth, uh, this noble, noble face, uh, or Saint John Paul, uh, the enthusiasm and the joy of millions, and Benedict who's student I had been when he was professor in Regensburg and with whom I had the privilege to work for many, many, many years. And now Pope Francis, whom I knew when he was auxiliary bishop in Buenos Aires, I met him first uh, in Buenos Aires. And uh, it's my joy to to work with him as it was my joy to be at the service of his predecessors. And I can tell you that none of these popes had been uh, exempt of critiques and very often harsh critiques. I remember a great theologian, I do not give the name, who was absolutely loyal to the church and to the Pope, who said to me, I pray for the death of Paul VI. <gasps> he was so shocked about his Eastern politics. As some are now shocked about the so-called Vatican Eastern politics to China and um, but he, at the same time, he wrote a magnificent theological book on papacy. Um, it is normal that the Pope is a human being. It is normal that he is uh, that he is a sinner. He goes to confession. Imagine. Uh, m m probably every week yeah. and oh that's nice thank you yeah. um, so we are a pontifical institute um, that means loyalty to the Holy Father is elementary for us for a, for a normal Catholic you must not be happy with all his decisions. Yeah. That's not requested. You must not feel easy with his temperament or with his culture. Yeah. That's normal. But in your heart and in your mind, a Catholic is loyal to the Holy Father. Um, even if sometimes it costs uh, some of my confreres, Dominican confreres yeah, and Jesuit confreres had to suffer a lot under Pius XII, unjustly accused in the discussion whether they are too open to modern thoughts or because they were not too mystic enough and too much inclined with the church fathers. And they, they had to suffer. Um, Father Conga, who was my teacher in ecclesiology, and Father de Lubac, who both became cardinals later, had interdiction of writing and publishing. And in this time, both of them have written their most beautiful books on the church. Uh, 
this is for me, that's a teaching I received as a young Dominican. By the greatness of these great men in their loyalty to the Pope, even if they had to suffer. So, uh, I hope you have not to suffer from the Pope, uh, but uh, I invite you to pray for him, as he always asks. Pray for me. And this is not a floskel. This is a serious demand. Pray for me. So, please pray for the Pope. And third and last point is, of course, we are an international theological institute um, with uh, the Studium Generale, with a new branch for uh, liberal arts. Um, but the heart of the institute remains the faithfulness to Catholic doctrine. And therefore, the core of this institute is to know, to know the Catholic doctrine. Um, an alumnus of ITI should be able to give witness of the hope that is in us, as St. Peter says in his first letter. And give witness means witness of life, but also witness of knowledge. That you may be able to speak about your faith in an int intelligible way. Uh, and in an int intelligent way. Um, yeah. Uh, I look at our dear... Professor Dani Keegard. Uh, we are co-workers with God's providence for many, many years. And um, I have a dream that if one day um, Holy Father allows me to hand over the ministry of uh, Archbishop of Vienna, that I can come to the ITI and what would I love most to do? Uh, hopefully together with Dani to teach the catechism. To teach the catechism. Because uh, as St. John Paul uh, wrote in his um, um, encyclical on priestly formation, he said, Theological studies should begin with the catechism and end with the catechism. At the beginning, to get an over, overlook, oversee, to oversee the, the, the entire Catholic teaching uh, in doctrine and morals and prayer and spirituality, liturgy. And at the end, when you have finished your studies, whether it be a two years program, a one years program, or five years, or even licentiate and doctorate, at the end, you should return to the catechism to see that all what you have studied forms a living synthesis, a symphony, the symphony of our faith and uh, Therefore, uh, solid doctrine training is the core uh, of ITA. Uh, that needs, of course, a prayer life, liturgy, that needs perhaps sport, perhaps not for me. I was with Churchill, no sport, uh, but... Uh, uh, leisure, um, uh, community life, but mainly serious studying of the church's teaching that enables you to become what so many are around the world, 
250, how many alumni we have? 400 alumni? I don't know. 400, yeah. Uh, all over the world, uh, alumni of ITI. And uh, they are hopefully uh, witnessing uh, our faith also through knowledge uh, and through personal witness. Sorry, that I, I said to the president that I will speak maximum 10 minutes. It was a little bit more. Uh, thank you, may God bless you. Thank you, Your Eminence. If anybody in this hall thinks that life is the same after these words, you have not paid attention. I would now like to proceed to the formal conferral of the professorial appointments. And as I said before, our Grand Chancellor will be personally handing out the appointment decrees to the professors. I would now like to ask to stand the following professors. Dr. Dorna, Dr. Haarstetter, Dr. Vladika, Dr. Brasche, Dr. Harant. Unfortunately, Dr. Kelly could not come because his flight was canceled due to storm. Cecilia, Dr. Gozia, and Dr. De Mayo. I will now read to you the appointments that will be conferred by His Eminence. Dr. Dorna will be appointed as Ordentlicher Professor in Ökonomische Theologie, Ostkirchenkunde und Judaistik. Dr. Haarstetter will be appointed as Ordentlicher Professor in Pastoraltheologie und Religionspädagogik. Dr. Michael Vladika will be appointed as Ordentlicher Professor in Christliche Philosophie, Metaphysik und Philosophie der Natur. Dr. Yves Brachet will be appointed as ex außerordentlicher Professor für Moraltheologie und Sozialethik. Dr. Gundula Harant will be appointed Sorry, I'm looking at the, uh, at the wrong notes here. Yes, uh, Dr. <laughs> Sorry, I will, I will go on to the, to the next one. Dr. Vince De Mayo will be appointed as associate professor or the Festangestellte Hochschuldozent für Neues Testament. Dr. André Gozia will be appointed as Associate Professor or Festangestellte Hochschuldozent for Interdisziplinäre Lehrstuhl für Quellenstudien. Dr. Timothy Kelly will be appointed as Festangestellte Hochschuldozent or Associate Professor für Dogmatik. 
And finally, Dr. Gundula, Dr. Gundula Harant will be appointed as Festangestellte Hochschuldozentin or Associate Professor in English for the Lehrstuhl, for the Lehrstuhl in uh, Sorry that I, uh, for the Lehrstuhl in, um, sorry, Dr. Halland, I'm, I'm a, I have the wrong notes here. Yes, it's okay, I have it on the decree. Forgive me my little uh, error here. Dr. Harant will be appointed as Associate Professor and Festangestellte Hochschuldozent für Fundamentaltheologie und Spirituelle Theologie. I would now like to invite each of the professors after Father Juray carries the gospel. May I ask the Grand Chancellor to invite the professors to speak the oath of fidelity.
Ich habe sie drückt. Ah, ich muss ja über den Tisch rücken. I don't have to worry now. I'm continuing the office of the instructor at the National Erotic Institute in Burma. Promise that I shall always preserve communion with the Catholic Church, whether in the words I speak or in the way I act. With great care, fidelity to the Church, carry out the responsibilities by which I am bound in relation both to the Universal Church and the particular Church in which I am called to exercise my service according to the requirements of the law. Carrying out Thank you. Please be seated. I will now call forward each of the appointed professors to sign the oath of fidelity, and then His Eminence Cardinal Schönborn will hand them their decree.
My warm congratulations to my colleagues for receiving finally the professorial appointments and together with His Eminence, I very much look forward to the next uh, occasion that will hopefully be ready at the opening of the academic year in uh, September of this year, where hopefully uh, some of the other professors will be receiving their formal professorial appointments and Nihil Opstad from the Holy See. I would like to conclude the academic celebration once again to speak from my heart to thank you, Your Eminence, for uh, bestowing the great honor on us to be here and to hand out personally these decrees. You and I have, together with the Dean, uh, fought hard for these decrees. Uh, we know the story that is behind it, and we also know how deserving each of the professors are in receiving these decrees and how privileged we are to have each one of you uh, amongst our faculty. So this will be a further step in what His Eminence has said in preparing each one of you in truly being those that go out into the world. And I can close on a note saying that there is a beauty to such a ceremony because such a ceremony highlights what His Eminence spoke about, that we are a canonical institute, that we stand in loyalty and love to the Holy Father, whomever the Holy Father may be at that time. And this ceremony today, which is the result of the careful and necessary work the Holy See does, where it regards each of the people teaching in its name, what we saw today, the ceremony today, was a beautiful example of that, a very concrete example of that, of how we as the International Theological Institute stand always in loyalty to the Holy Mother Church and to Peter who has been appointed to lead the church here on earth through the Holy Spirit. So again, in that, Your Eminence, your presence here today was another uh, example, another symbol, important symbol of that, that this is the way forward for the ITI. I herewith declare the second semester, the summer semester of the International Theological Institute as opened, and as the choir sings, we will all process into the Byzantine Chapel for Mass. One last final announcement. After Mass, all the members of the faculty and staff, as well as guests, will proceed to Cyril and Methodius for lunch. All the students will proceed to St. Therese on campus for lunch.